here to welcome Douglas Hagley, who's going to be chairing the next session. Douglas is the Chief Digital Officer for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 1997, after a career previously devoted to education and pediatrics research, he joined the Metropolitan Museum in his first go around there and convened one of the first ever review sessions about this thing called digital asset management and what role could it play at the Met. Later, his focus turned to the production of and management of digital content and sharing it across audiences. 10 years ago, he joined the staff of the Minneapolis Institute of Art as the first executive hired there in the capacity of chief digital officer. And in 2020, he returned to the Met in the role of chief digital officer, leading all digital and production, digital media production and strategy. And as I know and have benefited from so much insight into the museum world that Douglas has shared with me, he's always put people first, focused on the capacity for, uh, for technology to augment and enhance the way people accomplish their goals and find moments in delight. Douglas, thanks for the work that you and the panelists have put into this session. Welcome. Thank you, David. I hope everyone can hear me. That's a phrase uttered too often in virtual conferences, but. It is an honor to be here today. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending the session. Uh, and we'll get started as we come here. Here's our basic agenda today. Uh, we're gonna talk about dams in the museum sector. I'm gonna take a few minutes to kind of set a framework uh, where we'll talk about responsibilities, challenges, and elephants. And then we have two terrific presentations from Jennifer Seller and Jessica Knight. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves when we get to their section so that they can say the words that they want to say about themselves. We want to leave plenty of time for facilitated discussion, uh, Q&A at the end. And I know there are a lot of attendees and the Q&A can turn into a waterfall, but I'll try to keep an eye on it and we'll try to elevate the questions that, that are resonating most with, with the content we're talking about. So to set that framework, I want to talk a little bit about um, responsibilities. And when I talk about the museum sector, really I'm talking about the glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, a broad cultural heritage spectrum. And you know, if you think about it in a kind of simple way, there's stuff, you know, the, thing, the things that we collect, study, and preserve, both physical things as well as knowledge from the past so that we can share, because if you're collecting and not sharing, you're not in our sector, uh, and also maintain for the benefit of future generations. And I was so inspired by Monica's session earlier today um, to think about the ethics around all of this behavior that we consider to be our responsibilities. One of those responsibilities is to do these activities in an ethical, equitable, informed way. Of course, there are very real constraints around the way in our sector that we can address this kind of work, very real limits to the amount of money we can spend, a sort of overall limited software spend in general, or often sort of scraping along with whatever we can afford. There is a limited commitment to long-term tech investments that's sort of endemic in our sector. Unfortunately, people still tend to think of both hardware and software the way they would think of furniture. They buy it and then they forget about it for 15 years and they're sort of surprised that it's completely out of date. And far too often we're dependent on the skill of a single person to move us forward. Some of you know me, you know my background, my formal background is in clinical psychology. Uh, one of the things psychologists try to encourage our fellow human beings to do is to live in reality. Let's live in reality. So we have reality checks here, right? Our dam systems still very focused on our collection, often become shadow collections information systems. Our staff will still not trust the dams. They'll hoard assets and create their own mini dams in the network shares. And all the IT folks here today can chuckle at that one. And then we know that we want to integrate across systems and that's terrific, but it's also adds overhead, adds risk, especially if there's only one person who knows how the systems work. And then finally, of course, staff hate training and staff need training. And that's always gonna be a challenge that we face. I think some of you know one of my secrets, don't call it training, call it something in donuts, digital and donuts, technology and donuts, just don't call it training. And then there's an elephant in the room, right? And I sort of don't mean to chuckle. This is a terrible, awful, deadly pandemic we're living under. And the expectation that we can just press on, press forward without taking this into account is a kind of head in the sand approach. And I know that Jennifer is gonna talk a little bit about some impacts 
of COVID on the work, uh, on her work. It's coming up soon. This pandemic has, of course, vastly accelerated digital transformation in our organizations. You know, I've been doing this for about 25 years and, uh, you know, beginning around 1996, this was the sort of gesture in the face and the budget meetings that we would have, right? Why do we need all this? What, what do we really need to do this? Kind of what's the point? And the need to constantly justify. And then all of a sudden in March, right? Hey, Douglas, we're shutting down the museum. We go 100% digital tomorrow, right? That's accelerative. It's extremely stressful. I'm sure a lot of folks on this call have worked a lot of long hours to, to meet the needs, at least the expressed and the belief needs from their organizations. But I am an optimist at heart and I still sometimes can't help but feel a little like this. Again, after 25 years of, of sometimes asking for attention, it's rather nice to sort of be recognized in a way. So that's the optimist in me talking. That's the end of my framing. I'm now gonna pass the screen off to Jennifer Sellers, who will introduce herself and take us on. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, I wanted to talk about, as, as Douglas was talking about a little bit in his presentation, um, the elephant in the room, which is COVID, and we're almost a year in, and so I sort of wanted to go through some of the things that we're doing at MoMA um, to work, um, to continue to engage our users, because that's obviously one of the most important factors um, we talk about at this, um, at Henry Stewart a lot about how, you know, it's not a static dams are not static and obviously you need people to continue to use it and while uh, COVID has allowed us to really um, you know shine because dams are sort of the ideal systems for this it's really important to continue to figure out new ways to work with our users as, as Douglas also said that users don't necessarily like to have training um, so we've been looking at different ways to work with those. So I'll talk about that, but let me uh, give you a quick introduction about me. Um, I've been doing digital asset. I've been at MoMA for 14 years. Um, I started at MoMA um, in the imaging studio as the image archivist. So basically I was there hired to organize things that were on CDs and Excel spreadsheets since I've been here so long. Um, and they had actually originally already had chosen a dam system at the time um, because uh, they were looking at ways to get um, more materials online, um, but we did not launch that system until 2009. Um, MoMA currently has approximately 625,000 assets and primarily those are photographs, but um, we are moving um, more and more towards um, including video, audio, and other documents. And these are from departments across the museum, including conservation, retail, um, our archives, our education department. Um, and our project at MoMA is actually a joint project. Um, I'm in the imaging and visual resource studio, but um, we also, the other half of the um, project is run through our ID, ID IT department. Um, and our IT department basically is responsible for all the back end. We're still actually an on prem system. Um, so they will be doing any sort of system design, maintenance, upgrades, and integrations. And then um, they help us with um, automation on the back end. And then I would be responsible for all of sort of the front end administration, project management, workflow, taxonomy, um, and metadata and training, most importantly. And just quickly to go back, this is my office outside since we've been working both from home and, and we're going back actually to the offices next week. But I just wanted to talk quickly a little bit about some of the challenges that we're seeing um, almost a year in. Um, obviously, as we were talking about, we basically had a day to go back, you know, when we left from the museum to go fully work from home for several months. And so most of our users are actually um, weren't set up to be able to work from home. Most of them work on desktops. They don't necessarily have VPN. And since our system is um, on-prem and behind a firewall that we needed to have all that set up. Um, but we were very lucky, as I talk about, our team um, was fully set up to be remote. So we had all of our um, staff had laptops. We were already set up to be able to work from them and sort of 
be on the ground running. And, and several of us have already been working from home, either partially or full time. So we were able to really easily be able to do that. And so once users were able to catch up, you know, initially we may have had to help them a little bit, but um, they now are able to get onto the system very easily at home. Um, we've also seen decrease, decreased staffing and uh, people getting new roles. And then this is probably true across the museum world. Uh, MoMA had some early retirements. We had voluntary transitions. And so a lot of people that were sort of in these departments that we had worked with for years and years had basically disappeared very quickly. And while we weren't necessarily, you know, available. And so it was very difficult. Um, and then these, you know, we're not hiring new people. So these, these jobs have been shifted. And so we've really lost a lot of the people that were usually our point people in these departments. Um, and again, money, which, you know, Douglas had already talked about how money is very tight already. Um, and obviously museums are freezing their budgets. You know, there's not money to hire new people for these roles that have left. And so um, that will be a giant factor. Um, and then I, I talked about burnout. And again, people are online all the time. They don't wanna be in another meeting online. They have other things going on in their lives. They're working from home, other people are at home. Um, it's just, we need to be realistic and look at what we can and cannot do. Um, and some of the successes we found in our group, again, I was talking about that we were, we were already ready to work remote. We have a system that works really well remotely. Um, we had built really through all these years, a really strong foundation of relationships across departments. So whether or not these are the people that we work with, you know, for things like TMS, which is our, our collections management system team or our archives team or conservation, we had already really uh, had those out. And then also for the other departments, I always talk about um, with other people at the museum that my job is sort of to know everyone at the museum. If I can, inter you know, my sort of goal is to be able to be the person who introduces people to other people because I really know what they're doing in their departments, what their workflows are and what kind of assets they're creating. Um, and another thing that was great while we were, you know, we were able to focus on things that sometimes are things that we tend to ignore or not ignore, but get pushed down the, the list. So uh, documentation, more metadata, new features and some upgrades that we were doing. Um, and you can see on the left side, that's a, an image of MoMA has a, a tagging a tool that we use on a regular basis that allows us to tag objects, which would be online. And then also that data goes into our dam system. And during this period, our team was able to do um, already an additional 21,000 objects. So that allows users outside the museum and inside the museum to be able to use those. Can I go? Okay. Um, and one of the things that we've used, um, we were looking at sort of simple ways to engage our users. And so one of the easiest ways for us to do this was to look inside our system. You probably already have these tools in your dam. Um, and one of the things we realized is we, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our users log in, the first time they log in is through Active Directory, which is great for them. It's very easy. We don't have to create new accounts, um, but there isn't much data associated with that um, account when they log in. So we were able to go through because we had some extra time because we were getting maybe less assets initially. Um, and we were able to be able to go through those and even just adding um, their department information, their, you know, groups, project groups that they were in. And so that we can filter out that data um, and create new user groups, which also allows us to basically have, be able to gather more metrics, um, provide them searching capabilities and targeted metadata and permissions and out, you know, we're really able to reach out to those specific groups. Um, and we were also able to sort of, we had been, you know, compiling lots of those, those users and letting them be in there without sort of going through when people left or we didn't know people left. Um, and we've also connected with our HR department so that we get the reports that they have as, as soon as someone leaves. So that also lets us know to not only clean up the data in our system, but to reach out to those departments when people have gone, which is going to be fairly common in the next year or so, especially. Um, and then we also looked at how we were training and outreach and doing outreach with our users. Um, and again, because we're fully online, sometimes that's actually easier. Um, and we had more time obviously to do things like, you know, training documents to really update our documentation. And those are the kinds of things that sometimes sort of get uh, behind and you forget to do those um, while you're busy doing, you know, if there's a large number of assets, which is sort of gave us a pause and we were able to do sort of bite-sized training guides that were easily accessible to users on, on basically online for them. 
And one of the most successful things we've found and as you know, users don't always like training, um, but you want them to be able to use the system. And so you can see on the left side, this is an image from an exhibition that's actually currently up at museum, uh, up at MoMA, which is called General Ideas Magic Bullet. So you can see how Magic Bullet is spelled. Um, and so users sometimes have really difficulty finding these sort of exhibitions or artists and things like that. So we, we've created sort of these really old fashioned like reference librarian kind of guides, which is from my past as a library, like a traditional librarian. Um, and we found these are really useful. So these are online and they basically have links that allow users to go directly to the assets. So they don't have to realize, really be able to spell magic bullet in the way that it would be in the system. And this was really great for people when they were at home and we, you know, they had a day to go and then now we're doing all these sort of online exhibitions. Um, and then we tried out to, tried having virtual office hours and these tended to be, we thought this would be really successful. We emailed people and again, people hate training, so they don't want to train. So they tend to not, uh, you know, want to just sort of, they don't reach out to us. It's often we have to reach out to them. And, and if they ask us questions, we can usually use that as a jumping off point, but having just virtual office hours, they were sort of a passive training and it was very unsuccessful. So we actually dropped that pretty early on. And so we looked at sort of some of the trainings we were doing and we realized we we're in the midst of an upgrade. And so we were actually having our photographers in our department look at uh, going through related lists of tasks. And we realized that that also was for them a large amount of work. And it looked like the better way to do this would be actually sort of create a, a, a guide, a basically a thing, a, a, a list of five things that they would do that's related to actually what their job does and have them go through those tasks with us giving any training whatsoever. So not us showing them how to do it, but having them go through those tasks and basically use those results from that training session, those training sessions that they were doing on them, themselves, it would be like 10 minutes long. Um, and then basically jump off and have a training or discussion, more of a discussion with them about those results. And it also allowed us by doing sort of that series of questions with them in, in relationship to um, our photographers, it was how to find certain uh, installation exhibition images. Um, and so that allowed them to really um, not have to have be trained on things that they already knew. And it, so if everyone knew something, we weren't going to talk about it in training. And so they were really learning what they needed to learn versus us just telling them what they needed to learn. Um, and then we've uh, figured out from that, um, the photographers have actually been doing sessions with each other. And so one of the the photographers is very interested in our system as sort of a power user. And he actually did a session uh, last week to train other users. And that really works well um, on a specific thing. And they were, it was more, again, of a discussion, but they were learning how to use the system. And so we want to use both of those sort of modules in, in other departments, um, including think new interns coming in um, various departments throughout the museum so that they can actually train on things that they need to know. Um, and finally, we learned that we, if we incentivize training, uh, we can't give virtual donuts out, but we can uh, give things to users that are very useful for them. And so you can see that the Judd publication on the left side, we worked with our um, publications department and our imaging department to realize that they were, you know, usually they have a person assigned to a book and often that person is not used to using it, our system. And so they were able to use, um, we were, were able to train those people or give them the idea if they get training and learn how to do this process, then we would give them advanced permission so that they no longer have to go through an approval process for our images, which allows us, uh, allows them to learn how to use the system. They get the images right away, but it also saves us time because we're not doing the approval process and it saves the publications department time because they don't have to do training for them or, or go back and ask for other images. Um, and last, one thing where we continue to do, and this has been built on an earlier um, project that we've done, we've always had, we built an independent several years ago, uh, several museums who use the same system. We built together sort of an email group and we'd have meetings every, you know, quarterly together online, but we realized having a Slack channel would be a really great way um, to communicate with each other. And so this has been active for a couple of years, but it's really, really been active during COVID. Um, and it really allows us to ask any questions specific to our system, but not go through the vendor, which is great to, to, to sort of go as a group to ask our vendor things. 
um, if we want them. Um, and also just people have different skill sets. So it's really great to be able to use their skills if someone is stronger in something or else. And, and we were allowed uh, through this, a lot of these discussions during COVID, we sort of had, it would lead to uh, several discussions offline with sort of like more formal in, uh, presentations amongst the groups. So someone has just switched over from on-prem to SaaS, so they did a presentation. And you can see on the left is a, an image from one of our um, performances, uh, Simone Forte's Dance Construction. And, and we met with another museum about how we're working on not object or exhibition images, but how we're working with our um, um, performance images and how we catalog those. So it's really useful. And thanks. And so you can contact me with any questions. That's my email. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and let Jessica do her presentation now. Thanks so much, Jen. It was really interesting hearing about the uh, the current state at MoMA. And I didn't know that donut trick. So we're going to have to use that at, uh, at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, well, I wanna thank you all for having me. My name is Jesse Knight. I'm a digital collections manager at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And today I'm gonna to share with you a bit about our digital ecosystem and really more about the future of dams, where we wanna go and demonstrate its impact on sharing Holocaust stories. So in order to understand why dams is so crucial to the museum, you have to understand a bit about the museum itself. And this piggybacks with what Catherine was talking about in her keynote about technology serving mission. And one of the core missions that we have is to investigate and communicate why and how the Holocaust happened. Central to answering these questions is ensuring that we have as much evidence as possible available to scholars, to our staff, and to the general public. A lot of what we do is actually digital acquisition, where we collect and digitize another repository's holdings and oftentimes take custody of that digital version for long-term access and preservation. We collect materials from 58 countries around the world, which you can see here in orange. And this map really illustrates how far reaching the dispersal of Holocaust records was and how far people traveled to escape Nazi atrocities. So my colleagues throughout the office have done a lot of collecting and we've done a lot of digitizing to date. Uh, we have about 5 million pages of original personal paper holdings and 1 million of that is digitized in house. Um, we have about 125 million pages of Holocaust documentation that has been duplicated from other repositories around the world. 90 million of that is digitized. We have 27,000 oral history interviews digitally available, adding up to around 37,500 hours of testimony with witnesses. Uh, we have a thousand recorded sound collections ranging from things like radio broadcasts to music to war crime trial recordings, 5,600 uh, historic films that have been made digitally available, 17,000 objects of which 12,000 have a digital image associated with it. So you can really start to see the digital scale that we're working with. Our digital collections comprise about a petabyte of storage and we're continuing to grow year over year. And this brings us to the big question, which is what do we do with all of this stuff? And how do we make it accessible? To talk about dams, I also have to tell you a little bit about our overall management environment, which includes our preservation repository. So we started our digital asset management and preservation systems journey for real in about 2016. And this came after an intensive environmental scan of the digital landscape of the museum and the development of a digital roadmap. And the result was this model where we use a preservation software system for management, for asset integrity and security. And DAMS uh, is really more for collaborative work, access and dissemination through our public facing systems. In 2016, however, we knew we couldn't do everything at once. Others have touched on this, but these enterprise software and hardware systems are extremely costly. And we knew it would be very difficult to get one, let alone two of these things. 
Um, so we decided to prioritize implementing an enterprise preservation system to secure our materials before tackling enterprise dam. But that left us with this huge gap on the access side. Um, our preservation repository is a closed secure system designed to maintain the audit trail of Holocaust evidence. And it was never intended to be used for global access to our materials. So we had to figure out how we could fulfill our core mission to provide our materials to staff, scholars, and the general public. Over the past decade, we've cobbled together various ways to make different file types accessible um, for streaming media, like our historic film footage, oral history and sound recordings. Um, we've used cloud storage and a custom database um, combined with extremely rigorous naming conventions. And we rely 100% on pattern matching to pull material into our online catalog called Collection Search. For images like historical photographs, hierarchical archival collections, as well as um, institutional photos taken by our staff photographers at museum events, we're currently using an open source dam, which we've scaled to include a million of our 90 million assets. And we currently have about 100 users distributed throughout the institution. This open source dam uh, powers a few things on the access side. The system holds the images that feed our catalog using an image server and the International Image Interoperability Framework or IIIF to pull images into an open source viewer. It houses item level metadata like added transcription and translation data and captions, which are uh, page level searchable and deep linked in the catalog. And finally, we store and pull the archival inventories out of the dams, um, which you can see featured here above the viewer. Um, but we've known for a while that we had outgrown our open source dams. And for the past year, we've been working on a multi-year multi-phase project to ingest all of our various types of digital assets into a new enterprise level dams. So while we've been in the dams business for a few years now, in a lot of ways, it feels like we're just at the beginning of our story and future possibilities. And this will be a crucial next step for us as an institution because of what, what dams really does for, for any museum, but for the Holocaust Memorial Museum in particular is enable multi-perspectivity in research and programming. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but the evidence of the Holocaust is a collection of fragmented stories. And it seems that the further away you get from those individual fragments, the harder it is to comprehend how, how this could possibly happen. So creating these connected digital layers of context gets us that much closer to answering the how and the why the Holocaust happened. So I, I wanna tell you two stories today that demonstrate this multi-perspectivity in research and, and this digital layering. And the first story is that of a mass murderer named Johann Niemann. The museum received this important donation in 2020, and it was actually one of the last collections that we imaged before we were shut down due to COVID. I'm not gonna go into it too much today, but the story of how we acquired this collection is, is really fascinating. And if you're interested in learning more about this story or its provenance, my colleagues in archives and education have, have just done some really amazing programming that's available online. Johann Niemann was born in 1913 to a farming family in Wollen, Germany. Um, he had lots of siblings and attended elementary school and he passed his journeyman's exam to become a painter. But he didn't become a master painter because in 1931, at age 18, he joined the Nazi party. He started working in the German concentration camp system. Um, and by all accounts, he was ambitious. He showed initiative. And in 1934, he joined the SS. This, this collection documents his time working in the T4 euthanasia program, which was the name for the systematic murder of individuals with physical and mental handicaps. Neiman's job was to carry bodies from the gas chambers to the crematoria. And this collection documents that he was promoted again and again, uh, first to help establish the Belzac Killing Center as part of Operation Reinhardt, uh, the code name for the German plan to murder the approximately 2 million Jews living in German occupied Poland. The collection also documents his final assignment. Um, Niemann was promoted to de deputy commander of the Sobibor Killing Center in 1942 when he was 29 years old. 
And at this point, Niemann's story intersects with another story um, told through a collection that we acquired in 1999 and then digitized and made available in 2017. Selma Weinberg was born in Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, she was one of four siblings, the only daughter to observant Jewish parents. When she was seven, the family moved to Zwolle to open a hotel, which became quite popular with Jewish businessmen. Um, Selma describes her pre-war life and the hotel in her diary that she eventually donated to the museum. In May of 1940, the Germans invaded Zwolle. Uh, the family continued to run the hotel for the next two years, but in, in 1942, it was confiscated by the Nazis. Uh, Selma went into hiding after the hotel was seized, but she was eventually given up by a neighbor and sent to Westerbork Transit Camp for deportation. From there, in April of 1943, she was sent to the Sobibor Killing Center, and her story converges with the deputy commander, Johann Neumann. Miraculously, uh, Selma is selected to be one of 600 prisoners kept alive to work the camp. She was assigned the job of sorting through clothes and belongings from prisoner transports of those who had been gassed on arrival. On her first day at the camp, she met her future husband, uh, a Polish Jew named Chaim Engel. And over the next few months, they begin their lifelong love story, which began at Sobibor. Sobibor was divided into an officer's area with quarters and dining facilities, and then three main camps. Camp one uh, held the prisoner barracks where Selma and Chaim lived. Camp two was a working farm with administrative buildings and Camp 3 housed the extermination operation. In the fall of 1943, a rumor spread throughout Sobibor that the camp would be shut down, which would mean almost certain death for the prisoners. So a handful of organizers planned an uprising. And on October 14th of 1943, they picked off SS officer after SS officer by luring them into buildings and remote locations and killing them with what weapons they could get their hands on. Niemann, uh, the highest ranking official there that day, was the first to be targeted. He was lured into the tailor's barrack with the promise of a leather jacket, and he was killed by one of the uprising's organizers. Chaim killed a different SS officer with a knife that Selma smuggled to him. And when the prisoners finally attempted to make their escape, only about half of the 600 made it past the fence. Of the 300 who did get out, the vast majority were killed by the Nazis or in the minefields that surrounded the camp. In fact, of the over 167,000 people murdered at Sobibor, only an estimated 60 people survived. And Selma and Chaim Engel are two of those people. After they escaped, Selma and Chaim went into hiding in a barn in Poland. And while there, she started a diary and it details her time in Sobibor her life in hiding, a bit about her life um, in the Netherlands, and her romance with Chaim. After the uprising, Sobibor was raised and the evidence of its existence was virtually destroyed. And for decades, all we had were survivor accounts like Selma's of this horrific place. Historians have described it as a visual void. And then suddenly, just this last year, through this mass murderer's collection, were able to see what these survivors saw uh, through these photographs that you see here to better examine this history. So like I said, my, my colleagues have done some really amazing programming about Selma Engel and Johann Niemann that tells their, their stories just far better than I ever could. So if you're interested, um, we have a Facebook Live series and there's a ton of resources available on the museum's website. But why am I telling you these stories? Um, the stories of Selma and Chaim and the 167,000 victims of the Sobibor Killing Center are inextricably linked to the story of Johann Neumann. And by digitizing this material and putting it into our dams, we're not only making our mountain of Holocaust documentation available as standalone collections with their own provenances, but what we're, we're allowing for is for them to be studied together and to be easily remixed for external facing programs to make persistent connections between the fragments of memory like oral testimony and the undeniable visual record like that of a perpetrator's photo album. And dams is the backbone of the USHMM digital strategy. 
that allows the personal stories of the Holocaust to be woven into a network of connected histories and shared experiences. It enables researchers and the general public not only to more easily zoom in on the individual, but perhaps even more importantly, to zoom out and better grasp the expansive scope of the Holocaust and just the sheer scale of suffering at the hands of the Nazi regime. So we're really excited about what future phases of dams will look like for us. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have during the Q&A. Thank you, Jessica. It's such a compelling story and emotionally wrenching too, I think. And that is, uh, is why some people are so sort of curious about some things. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna just send a couple questions your way right off the bat. But people are curious if the US Holocaust Memorial Museum does work with things like ancestry.com or a network of other Holocaust museums to sort of share stories and connect these narratives together. Sure, we actually do both. Um, we have a partnership with Ancestry.com called the World Memory Project. Um, so you can actually go and volunteer right now to index some of our uh, materials that we've uh, given over to them to use their indexing software. And then we are partners with um, Holocaust museums and organizations throughout the world. We're part of the um, uh, of Erie, the European I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> uh, the European Holocaust Research Initiative, um, as well as other Holocaust organizations. Thank you. And I think, Jennifer, while you were talking, a question came up because you were using the word we and people. I think it's it's helpful in our sector, too. Like, who, who do you mean by we? What's the size and makeup of your team? And, and then, Jessica, if you would follow on from with the same question. Yeah, so uh, my team is, uh, there are two of us, uh, there, there is some, on, on, on my end through, uh, we're under, under the Imaging and Visual Resource Department. Um, I have a person, I, they're called Digital Image Archivists, but that's a very outdated uh, term, really, but that's uh, the way we name our, 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 our positions. But we work at, on, on the IT side, there is a DBA, a database administrator, who really is integral to obviously, like, we would not be able to, you know, exist without that. Um, and then a, a junior, a, a developer who works with us on the back end. Um, but we really work with people pretty much in our collections management team on a daily basis. And then the archives, really, those people are really integral as well, um, even though they're technically not on our staff. Um, I think MoMA is successful. Uh, their dam has been so successful mostly because, as I said, we really are a we. Um, and it's across these different departments. Um, that it's not just owned by us. Um, and so we're really able to integrate it throughout the museum because of that. And for us, um, it, it's very similar. Um, there's a small handful of us who work in digital asset management and preservation, um, but all of our workflows are tied to our archives and curatorial affairs areas. Thank you. And I think, you know, in answering that question, it's always helpful to know the size of an organization too, right? So I'm working at the Met. The Met's the largest art museum in the Western Hemisphere. So we have more than 2,000 staff. I can say there's about four full-time people devoted to digital asset management. They are part of the collection information management team. But again, they do, like you said, Jennifer, they work in collaboration with folks in other parts of the museum in order to do their job successfully. But I think you know that the smaller an organization gets, the more hats people have to wear and the, and the fewer resources we get to. And I think that's always one of the challenges that we're dealing with. Um, one of the questions that came in, and I'm gonna kind of paraphrase it, but it's a justification question in a way. And in your two careers, what do you do when your organization just kind of doesn't get it, right? They don't really know what digital assets are, how many there are, how expensive it was to make them, what value they could have. Um, and it's hard to convince them that centralizing these processes is actually useful. How would you approach someone who's struggling with that, that sort of basic level of helping their organization move forward? Um, Jessica, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I think this is um, a Jerry Maguire moment, which is help me help you. Um, because for us, we spent about four years putting documentation together, um, building the case, 
Um, and then, you know, so we're, we're a federal organization, literally within a month, we had put together, we had secured funding and put together our uh, RFP and got it on the street. And that's because of that four years of, of pre-work that we had done when the money dropped into place to be able to say, yes, go. Um, and I, that's what I would recommend is make sure you have your documentation, you have your justification, you have done due diligence, you know what vendors you wanna work with, um, especially if you're doing a competitive bidding process so that when somebody says yes, they don't second guess it. They can just, everybody can just move. Homework, homework matters. Good point. Jennifer? And obviously, yes, relationships, but, uh, and getting, building those cheerleaders throughout different departments. But I also think inter integration is incredibly important, right? So uh, we now have, you know, our dam is now integrated, obviously, with our collections management system and also our, our website. And now, obviously, um, you know, as you said, everything, now people want everything digital, every outface, you know, because of what's going on. And I think having those integrations really helps you um, because you also have cheerleaders and those, those other departments need you. Um, so they're willing to also work with you to, to explain to people above you. Um, and that's really helpful, I think. Um, but just early on, really getting people involved, not making it sort of a project only for your department is really important. Um, you know, all the governance, all that stuff that they talk about at Henry Stewart constantly, really, if you have that foundation, I think it, it's really um, helpful for those people who may not buy in initially. And I, I would, it resonates, and I, what both of you said really resonates with me. I think I would add, you know, during, this moment in time um, when digital has been suddenly pushed to the forefront and where there's an anxious scramble to be doing things digitally so that we don't lose our customer base, right? Our, our museum visitors. Now I'm of the opinion that in some ways you don't really wanna turn on the fire hose because that's not really a way to engage with people. You don't wanna just blast them with digital content nonstop. But clearly both of your organizations are capable of weaving narratives and putting together stories based on these digital assets that you can get to quickly and easily. And I think in there in many ways is the value and the organizations across our sector that have been successful with digital engagement during closure are those who had these systems in place and knew where to find their assets and didn't have to go scrambling or trying to create new assets through that process. So has there been a shift during COVID times for either of your organizations. I know, Jennifer, you talked, I think, mostly about sort of the work you're doing and workflows and things that you've been able to accomplish. But what about utilization of assets? Has there been a shift in that at MoMA? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 a little bit, I think, right now. I think in the long term, it definitely will be greater. I think right now we're just trying to exactly sort of build upon what we already had existing. But I do think people are starting to look at different things that we're creating. So obviously for us, you know, we were talking about this in your, in your slides, you talked about images as being sort of the primary thing at museums. And I think that shift, you're gonna see the shift obviously in the next couple of years, because what we're producing now is, you know, even if museums, our museum is open right now, but people are not, you know, there can't be per, performance, you know, performances are very limited. You're not, you're having classes online. So more of the video, you know, really we're shifting to those and, and having online things. So I think we'll, our workflow and things like that, we'll have to focus much more on that. I think we, you know, the images are sort of really organized and, and, and we don't have a lot, a ton of work to do with that, but Sort of looking at and also that people will sort of I think hopefully start looking at ways to reuse the content we have versus just as you said just creating more and more content is really looking thoughtfully back at what you have to be able to use it um, in that's in the system so because people just won't have the money to create new things which is sort of what's been happening I think in the sort of crazy years of museums in the last couple of years. Jessica have you seen a change in, in utilization of assets in the dam? From a user's perspective, um, within our online catalog collection search, we've seen an 18% increase in traffic, um, which has been pretty amazing. Um, from a staff perspective, it's, it's sort of hard for us to say what's COVID and what's just part of the transformational process of implementing an enterprise dams, um, because we are in this, in this time of change as we move from one system to another and pinpointing, you know, 
what we can attribute to what is uh, kind of difficult. A, a question just came in and, you know, and here we are sort of guilty of doing exactly what I said, one of our risk points is, is we're talking about our dams and we're talking about collections and we're, what about the other stuff, right? So all the other assets in the organization, do your organizations have other resources for marketing and communications? Do you have, or does your dams embrace a much wider array of assets across the entire organization? Jessica, let me start with you. Yeah, so like I said in my talk, we uh, include our institutional photography uh, within our dams, and it's the access point for um, for folks in you know in development to pull photographs for proposals, to send um, images to donors, um, to pull things for you know slideshow presentations like these. Um, so so we do bring that in, and we have a governance structure that we're putting into place to approve more institutional material to be uh, brought into the dams as we move forward. But yes, the plan is for our new enterprise dams to be you know, the single source of truth, both for the institutional archives and for the historic collection. Jennifer, do you address the full array of, of assets across all organizational units? Uh, a full array is probably, uh... <laughs> Not full array, but um, yeah, we definitely, you know, as I was, we really have, you know, exhibition and, and uh, you know, objects are really sort of, we have those really fully, or I think under, we understand that we have workflows that work really well. Um, and again, I talked a little bit about tagging our exhibition history. We've really looked in the last year or so um, to really uh, get a good gauge on materials created by other departments that are really related to um, you know performance and events that were not necessarily naturally cataloged and not, ca not cataloged in our uh, CML you know in our collections management system um, so we're we're building upon what blocks we already sort of have because realistically we don't you know we have that infrastructure in place um, that we could sort of jump off of, but we also work really extensively with our, our conservation department. Um, and we had a project this last year working with our registrars to really sort of organize and, and get their um, loans, you know, they, they do all this documentation related to loans and things like that. So that, so sort of almost a hybrid of records management, but things that they would use um, through our conservation team. So they actually want to look at sort of, um, images of works, uh, you know, through the years, depending and looking at them when they're doing conservation work. So we looked at sort of a really sort of way to do those assets, which, you know, sort of as sort of falls into a records management thing, but it was they needed to access them, which is why they're being put into the dam. I see the clock ticking. I, I want to ask sort of one future oriented question. But first, I want to thank everyone for adding to the chat and the Q&A. There's so many of you, so many great questions. There's no way we can get to all of them. I think any of the three of us are happy to continue our conversations with you. You can find us, you know, social media, LinkedIn, email, whatever it may be. But I want to ask the two of you to sort of give me one minute each kind of on the future. What's ripe for innovation? What's something that would be a really cool thing in our sector and dams that would, that would excite you for the future? Go ahead, Jessica. Well, for us, it has to be machine learning. I, I think that that's really where our interest in, um, you know, you, I told you all a little bit about the scale of the material that we have and, you know, things like facial recognition, like OCR, like speech to text um, are, are going to be crucial image analysis. They're gonna be crucial for, um, you know, helping us better catalog and identify our material. Such a huge trove, I, I can imagine it really. How about you, Jennifer? Yeah, she's, Jessica sort of stole my answer. <laughs> figuring what out. she said. Yes, yeah, what she said. No, I mean, which is interesting, although AI with the uh, modern art is always an interesting facet. Yes, it's, uh, but again, yes, and we're doing sort of more three, uh, our, you know, our, obviously COVID has sort of slowed down some of these projects, but we're doing a lot of, you know, three 3D, you know, photography, photogrammetry, and things like that, that I was, you know, very interested in working with and getting in their dam. Um, 
so yes, but AI and I'll sort of looking at those kind of things and, and figuring out how to really connect because we don't, um, as you said, it's often a one person team. So to really look at ways that we can make these as accessible as possible without a huge amount of people, but that's usually very difficult to do. Well, it goes back to those kind of real world constraints that we have to work in. And as much as we all want to be dreamers and you know hope that some fantastic robot technology will fix everything here for us. The truth is that technology will be unaffordable to us for some period of time, even if it does exist. But, you know, I think if you think about Moore's law and eventually these technologies will become available to us, they'll be more consumer grade uh, and they'll give us these capacities to really do these kind of highly um, informed searching and filtering of assets that we do have, as well as identifying them in ways that we hadn't thought of identifying them before. And you're seeing some of this already happening out, even in the Wikimedia universe, which is really interesting too, connecting things that you'd never thought about connecting before. I fear that I'm gonna get cut off any second now with the clock ticking. I wanna thank both of you again and thank everyone for coming to the session. And I think I'm welcoming David back in to sort of transition us to the next thing we're doing. Hi, David. Good, good afternoon. Thanks for everyone. Uh, what a fascinating thing to listen to and to the discussion. Uh, next up in track one is James from Wyden in the Tech Lab. If you have any questions after his session, remember to visit the Wyden booth at the exhibition tab. His session will be followed by a short break to grab another cup of coffee or tea, and then join Birds of a Feather Lounge discussions. Click on the Networking Lounge tab and take a seat at the virtual table for thought-provoking discussions that are facilitated by experts in each of the topical areas. And I'd say that's a fair reflection of what I got to listen to by joining the three of you as a participant just now. Good afternoon. Thank you each for your contributions. <laughs>